So, thanks for coming. Uh, the talk today is, why did somebody think this is a good destination? And of course, the reason I'm saying this is because I'm treating time as a destination, right? We are four-dimensional beings. We operate in three dimensions in physical space, and then we travel through time. If you were to jump into a car and drive to 1212 Rio Grande Street, you would arrive at this destination. This destination has an arbitrary name, 1212 Rio Grande Street, right? Uh, it's just a, an imaginary made up name that we applied to it so that we could give it a, a, a position on a map so that you could find it with GPS. Um, and then it has a building which was created by humans. It isn't uh, a natural feature, it's a human made feature. And the same is true for 2022. It has an arbitrary name, right? Uh, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, no, it's supposed to be 2,022 years after Jesus was born. Last I checked, I think most scholars think he was born 3 BC. So Jesus was born three years before Jesus, which I find fascinating. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. I kind of feel like there's something metaphysical there that I just haven't quite gotten. Maybe like the Trinity, it's really complicated and goes over your head. Not sure. In any case, 2022, also the events, the political structure, the social structure, the economic structure, our, our, our world is also a destination that was shaped by humans. We didn't get to this moment if there weren't a set of political and economic and social decisions that were made that led to this moment. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of, I have no, no expectation that I'm going to truly answer the question, how did we get here, why did we get here? But what I want to do is I want to dive in and explore it a little bit. I want to see if, I, if we can tease out some of the elements that led to this moment. And uh, to do that, one of the things I want to start with is a man named Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Vladimir Zhirinovsky, as the name suggests, was Russian. And he's kind of a strange character because he did something revolutionary in 1992. He formed a political party. Zhirinovsky passed away today, so I really feel like his ghost is in this room, and that's why I'm going to invoke him and, and, bring, and start with him, because I want to commemorate, I want to memorialize this moment. What Zhirinovsky did was he created one of the first political parties. And it may have actually been the first political party, but I'm not a Zhirinovsky expert, so I could be wrong about that. In 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union, when communism went away. The stated objective of his party, which was called the Liberal Democratic Party, was to create a center-right party. That was their stated goal, which is hilarious since they call themselves liberal. For the record, liberals are a center-right po po political ideology. They are not leftist. And so Zhirinovsky apparently understood that even though Americans don't. Having said that, that's not what he created. He created a right-wing loon <laughs> political party that was crazy. He never was elected president of Russia. He never had that kind of high position. He was the head of his party um, for, uh, I'm doing the math here, let's see, he wasn't, he, he wasn't in charge from 2000 to 2011. So he was the head of his party for 19 of the last 30 years. He died as the head of his party. And he, even though he never attained a rank really higher than being a member of the Duma and being the head of his party, he was so outspoken and so outrageous and so over the top and so far to the right that American news media had picked up on him and they kind of latched on to him. And, and he sort of became the boogeyman of the 90s, the Russian crazy guy. And we would wait for him to say some off the wall insane thing. Like at one point he said, Russia should carpet bomb the Baltic states and Poland. At another point, he started saying, we should use the nuke against the United States. 
At another point, he said, we should invade the United States, conquer Alaska, and take it back by force. We should have never sold it. And he even asked us to sell it back to him, back to the Russians. <laughs> Zhirinovsky even went so far as to do this, the cringe moment from the 90s in Russian politics. He did a interview where he talked about himself. And he said, you ready? That he was a pervert and that he had these really strange sexual desires and that he actually exercised them and that he, he had gone off the deep end into perversion. And then he explained why. And here's his answer, the Jews. <laughs> his father was Jewish, by the way. Oh, Jewish Ukrainian, uh, like Volodymyr Zelensky. How's that for hilarious? And so Vladimir Zhirinovsky gets to go down in history as one of the early right-wing loons of European politics. In fact, what people were saying at the time was that he's so out of touch, he doesn't understand the, re the political reality of the world, that he's, he's lost it. And he's gone off this right-wing deep end at a time when the whole world is moving in, moving in the direction of liberalization. It's moving in the direction of democracy. It's moving in the direction of having free and fair elections and civil rights. And here's Zhirinovsky talking this crazy nonsense. He's out of touch. And actually, what I think he was, was a guy who understood the direction the world was going in. He was actually just before his time. Because the destination 2022 is marked by a few really interesting things. One, we have fewer democracies on the planet today than we did last year and then we, than we did the year before. In fact, we're probably on year 13 of fewer and fewer democracies. Which is exactly where Zhirinovsky was going because you gotta remember when Zhirinovsky is creating his political party as possibly the first ever political party in Russia post-communism, post one of his goals is to end Russia's democracy, ironically enough. So if he had gotten elected president, he wanted to go down an authoritarian path. Well, that's the direction the Earth has gone in for about 13 years. I've seen multiple studies that use a different year. I'm going to just go with the 2009 event as a, as a marker. Another really weird thing about the world today is the strange shape that the global economy is in. It's a, it's a, it's a really bizarre condition to be in. Interest rates are way, way below inflation rates, right? So I'll just out myself. I have uh, almost a 4% interest rate on my house. It's 3.875. The inflation rate is 7.9. Every year, I'm effectively pocketing more than three percentage points because it's effectively a negative interest rate because the value of my mortgage is shrinking because of inflation and I'm not paying enough interest to compensate for the rate of shrinkage. And the Federal Reserve just moved up, it just increased the interest rate to 0.5%. We, we have been sitting at a quarter percentage interest rate. We did briefly get to half a percent after the 2008 economic catastrophe. We did briefly get to half a percent, but then we went back to a quarter percent. And at one point we had a, a, a strange interest rate that was called zero to 0.25 percent because we, we couldn't go lower than zero, right? So when we got to zero, and you didn't, it couldn't be zero, <laughs> so we had an interest rate that was virtually zero. Well, that's life support. That's what you do when your economy is collapsed and you're trying to revive it. Well, we've been trying to revive this economy for 14 years now. We've had an economy, a global economy on life support for 14 years. At, one, at some point, you're going to want to pull the plug and let the patient die. Do you know what I'm saying? 
I mean, at what point? Of course, the answer is never. We'll never do that. But it's a bizarre situation to be in. It's so bizarre. At one point, in Europe and in Japan, it was possible to get a negative interest rate loan. If you took out a loan, the bank literally was paying you money every month for having a loan. Talk about the upside down. And then on top of that, we have runaway global warming. If you read the UN report, we are hosed. We are in catastrophic land. They're basically saying, if we don't act right now, and by right now they mean 2022, they do not mean 2023. 2023 is too late. They said, if we do not start right now, there's no way we're going to keep it at 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're already at 1.1 degrees Celsius. So the goal was to only add another 0.4 degrees Celsius. And so what the, what the UN report then says is, since we don't think there's the will to stop global warming from spiraling out of control, here's some ideas on how we can maybe learn to live with it and mitigate it. That's bad. That's not a place we want to be. And so there's all these different directions in which you look at 2022 and you think, man, this isn't great. And then add COVID on top of it, just to bring it home. COVID is SARS. This is the second SARS outbreak. SARS broke out the first time in 2002. We contained it in 2002. And then we had MERS in 2014, which was a cousin of SARS. And we contained MERS in 2014. And then we had SARS come back, SARS-CoV-2, in colloquially called COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2 comes back and it burns through the global population. Why? Because, in part, the President of the United States refused to act. The Chinese locked China down. Even though the Chinese are now going through one of their worst outbreaks, They've locked China down again, and they locked it down so tight, they're already coming out of that outbreak, and they, they've effectively not had COVID. They've had little bursts, and there are moments where things went really bad, like Hong Kong recently decided to kill all its gerbils. Uh, Hong Kong is now a gerbil-free zone because they realized that gerbils could get COVID, and they didn't want gerbils transmitting it, so they slaughtered their gerbil population. I'm thinking there were probably other things that could have been done, but that's how desperate Hong Kong was to prevent this thing from, from rolling out of control. And I'll, honestly, at the end of the day, you know, like if somebody came to me and said, if we wipe out your gerbils, you'll be fine, I, and I had any, I don't, but I would be handing them over. You, uh, you want me to do it myself? I got this. So having said all of this, I want to ask the question, how did we get to this moment? And of course, my focus is, on the politics of it, right? I'm sure there's lots of other stuff that, we, that needs to be looked at, like the psychology of it, um, but I'm gonna focus on the politics of it. And the place I wanna start is by telling you a story about something that actually happened, has, has been happening now for 22 years. And the, the story is gonna start in Poland. Actually, I guess technically it starts in the United States. Is that right? No, I guess it starts in Poland. I never know when to start my story. Okay, so 4.6 billion years ago. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, there was a sociologist, a, a Polish-American sociologist named Jan Gross. Jan Gross decided he wanted to write a book about coming clean about Poland's role in the Holocaust. Now, this was personally very important to him because his mother, during World War II, had been a Polish resistance fighter, and she had been, a, a, she was a guerrilla soldier who was slaughtering Nazis. So he's got a badass mom, right? Just total badass mom. And in the process of being a, a guerrilla fighter, his mom rescued a Jewish Polish man at one point and saved his life, fell in love with him, and the guy dies, and she's heartbroken. She continues the fight, she rescue, rescues another Jewish-Polish man, saves his life, ends up marrying him, and that's Jan Gross's dad. 
So Jan Gross is the product of this nightmarish event that takes place in Poland where his badass mom comes through and is saving people's lives and is killing Nazis. Just an awesome person. No two ways about it. In the process of him, he, he ends up having an academic career in the United States. He's a sociologist with PhD, he's a professor. He decides in 2000 that Poland needs to heal more. That Poland's process of healing from the Holocaust isn't over yet. You gotta remember, five million Poles died in the Holocaust. I mean, I, I should say in World War II. Three million were Jewish Poles, so three of the five million died in the Holocaust, and then the other two were Catholic Poles. Poland suffered, right, it went Soviet Union, China, Poland, Poland had, the, sorry, Soviet Union, China, Germany, Poland. Poland had the fourth worst fatalities in World War II. As a percentage of their population, it was a huge chunk of their population. It was an absolutely catastrophic event. Germany tried to do to Poland what we did to North America, right? We were going to exterminate and, and enslave the, the locals and take the land and then bring in colonists and then repopulate it and rename everything. So it wasn't a kind thing that Germany was doing, but it also wasn't exactly black and white. For the record, to be clear, and I bet Jan Gross would agree with me 100%, Poland was the victim. I don't want anybody getting confused about what I'm about to say next, but that didn't mean that there weren't some Poles who did the wrong thing. There was a town called Jadwabna, in July of 1941, so Germany conquered Poland. Uh, Germany attacked Poland in September, September 1st, 1939, and it took about a month to conquer Poland. So by the time we get to July of 1941, it's not quite two years later. It's one year and what, nine months later. So uh, <clears throat> the German Nazi occupation of Poland has been going on for a while. The, the Germans had Einsatzgruppen, they were SS soldiers who would travel the countryside looking for Jews to kill them. When the, the SS arrived at Yadwabna, they found that the Jewish population had already been rounded up and then put into a barn. In other words, what normally happened when the, when the SS would show up in a town in Poland or Russia or Ukraine, wherever they were going, a group of Jews would escape. They would escape because they ran away. They would escape because they were hidden by the locals, right? Catholic Jews would, uh, Catholic, Catholic Jews, Catholic Poles would hide the Jews. Or, or they would just pretend to not be Jewish and nobody seemed to notice and they'd get away with it. But at Yadwabna, the Catholic Poles round up the Jews preemptively before the Germans arrive and stick them in the barn, so it's going to be 100% in this occasion. This is like the most successful extermination of Jews that the, that the SS managed to pull off in World War II because the locals went and grabbed the Jews for them. And the SS murder the Jewish population at Yadwabna. If you go to Yadvabna, there is a shrine in the middle of town commemorating the heroics of Catholic Poles. On the edge of town, where the woods begin, there's another shrine noticing the massacre of the Jews at Yadvabna. And what, what Jan Gross wanted to do was reconcile the two truths. Because think about it, that's exactly who he is. He is both truths. His mother was the Catholic Polish glorious truth of resisting the Nazis and, and fighting back and saving Jews. And his father was the Jew that was being saved. So he knew that was the truth. But there was this other truth. There was this moment where in weakness or fear or maybe Jewish hatred, a group of Poles collaborated with the Nazis in this really ugly way. 
And this is what Jan Gross believes, believed, believes? I bet he still believes it. I don't know, though, because of what happens after this. I believe it, and I'm probably wrong for believing it, and I'm probably making a terrible mistake. The only way you can move forward is when you acknowledge your mistake and apologize for it and have a conversation about it. But I don't think anybody needed anybody to go to prison or there to be war crimes, tribunals, none of that. I think all that needed to happen was Poland needed to have a conversation. And so Jan Gross does something that I think is brilliant, but I, I might be an idiot. He wrote a book about it, about Yad Vavna, called Neighbors. And he published the book in 2000. And here's what happened. Poland went Nazi. Two brothers get together and they create the Law and Justice Party. The two brothers in 2001 create the Law and Justice Party to be, what they say, a center-right political party and they go flying to the right. And what's crazy about this party, the Law and Justice Party, is they openly say they hate liberal democracy. They're against it. Right? They're not even hiding it. They do great in 2005. They win enough votes in 2005 that they actually got first place. They didn't win a majority, but it gave them the opportunity to create a coalition government. They create a coalition government. It collapses basically the next year. It collapses in 2006. They create a second coalition government, but this time with political parties that are even further to the right than them. So it's three extreme far right wing political parties running Poland in 2006 and 2007. And when they, and when they were approached by the Odwabna thing, when they were asked, why did you create this political party? They would say, we didn't collaborate with the Nazis. They denied the truth of what happened. Instead of, instead of Jan Gross's book reaching out to them and saying, look, let's, there, there was this terrible event, let's own it and let's make peace over it and let's move on. Instead of them doing that, they went into denial mode and they went flying to the right. And in that right wing fervor, they end up, their government ends up collapsing in 2007. Um, the, two, the two political parties that they had made a coalition government with were uh, corrupt. There were accusations of uh, sexual misconduct, backroom deals that shouldn't have been appropriate, that weren't, weren't appropriate, and finally the government collapses in 2007. In other words, the Law and Justice Party only sur survived in charge for, for two years. Well, until 2015. So something strange happens in 2010. In World War II, Germany attacked Poland. But before Germany attacked Poland, Germany had made a deal with the Soviet Union. And the deal was, you let us attack Poland, and we'll give you part of Poland. So the Soviet Union and Germany split Poland in World War II. By the way, for the record, the Soviet Union kept that peace. So after World War II, when Poland was being reconstituted after Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union had gotten rid of Poland, Poland was dramatically shrunk. So the Soviet Union went, no problem, it's no big deal. We're going to go ahead and keep our part. But there's no reason Germany should keep Eastern Germany. And they chopped Eastern Germany off and gave it to Poland. So Poland ended up being about the same size. <laughs> they just pushed it to the west. They just shoved Poland towards France at Germany's expense. Uh, one of Poland's major cities was a town called Lvov. You've heard Lvov in the news lately. It's Lviv, because that's how the Ukrainians pronounce it. When this happened, when Lvov was handed over to the Soviet Union in 1939, it was 50% Polish. It was only about 20% Ukrainian. It was a Polish city with Ukrainians and Ruthenians. There, was other, there were other ethnicities mixed in there. 
but it was a Polish city. Today it's 1% Polish. Lviv was ethnically cleansed of its Polish population. That Polish population was then brought into what used to be Eastern Germany and they became colonists after they had effectively been shoved out of their homes. Right? Well, when the Soviets captured that part of Eastern Poland that they kept, that they didn't give back, they had a problem. And the problem was they had all these Polish officers. They didn't know what to do with, so they executed them. They just murdered them. I, I want to say 5,000, don't quote me on that number. It was, it was a significant number of Polish officers. And they just dug a pit and shoved their corpses into the pit. So in 2010, a group of top Poles, including the president of Poland, including generals from the Polish army, decided to fly to Russia to go and commemorate the mass execution of those Polish officers. And after they got back in the airplane to fly back to Poland, their plane mysteriously came out of the air and crashed and they all died. The whole top portion of the Polish government died. And all of a sudden Poland was stuck popping up these interim presidents until they could hold new elections. I know there was at least two interim presidents, but for some reason I think there were three. But there were two for sure. One was, a, was interim president for just one day. <clears throat> In 2015, still reeling from the possible assassination of their government, Poles went flying back to the right. They elected the law and or the Law and Justice Party, the Law and Justice Party in, over the course of the last seven years have completely destroyed Poland's democracy. So you keep hearing Poland on the news, the Poles are welcoming the Ukrainians, the Poles this, the Poles that. We are right now celebrating the Nazi government of Poland. It has eliminated the First Amendment rights that we think we like so much for, of speech and protest and news media. They have captured the news media. There is a monopoly of control over the news media. In the exact same way, Vladimir Putin has control over the news media in Russia. Our ally, Poland, our NATO ally, Poland, the, a member of the European Union, is no more democratic than Russia is. And the party ruling Poland, which has ruled Poland for the last seven years, openly says its goal is authoritarianism. It's not even pretending that it's a democracy. In 2017, they stacked the courts so that they could eliminate the court system. The European Union has actually invoked Article 7. And Article 7 says that you are in violation of the democratic principles of the European Union. And, and there, there, there is the possible threat Poland could be ejected from the EU for this. Poland has also banned abortion. Poland is rated as the worst state in the European Union for the treatment of the LGBTQ community. They are truly right wing today. Totally. They've lost it. And in part because a guy wrote a book. He triggered a series of events that led to that moment. Because he wanted to reconcile an ugly truth with a population of people who had wanted nothing to do with it. To give you an idea of how far to the right Poland is, I don't know if you all remember this, but there was a Syrian civil war where millions of Syrians were, and Iraqis were pouring into Europe. Why Iraqis, you ask? Well, because those Iraqis were refugees from when we blew Iraq up. Remember when we attacked Iraq, a country that never attacked us, never had the means to attack us, and never threatened to attack us? And didn't even recently attack its neighbors, right? It had attacked Kuwait in 1990, but we attacked it in 2003. <laughs> They're unrelated at that point. Well, we created a massive Iraqi refugee crisis, and Syria ended up hosting millions of Iraqis. So when Syria plunged into civil war, those Iraqis plus a bunch of Syrians fled and they tried to go to Europe. 
and the Poles treated them like absolute garbage. But what have the Poles done for the Ukrainians? Opened the doors to their homes. The Ukrainian refugees in Poland aren't living in camps. They're living in Polish homes. They're being treated like guests. What's the difference between Syrians and Iraqis and Poles? Skin color and religion. <clears throat> another, another interesting thing about this government. Um, at one point, this government denied that Auschwitz was in Poland. Auschwitz is in Poland. This isn't up for debate, just like Chernobyl is in Ukraine, <laughs> just like Texas is in North America. That's just where it happens to be. Israel was furious. They were like, we're thinking of cutting off relations with you. What do you mean Auschwitz isn't in Poland? <laughs> what does that mean? On another occasion, in Germany, Germany likes to send field trips to Auschwitz because Germany is really keen to make sure that never happens again. Right? And so one of the ways that Germany has, has done this is they send their kids, their students, to Auschwitz. I've been to Dachau. I've never been to Auschwitz. I've got to tell you, Dachau was so traumatizing. I'm good. I never want to be part of genocide. I'm cool with that. Like that, th that, that was a great lesson. I'm on board. I think it's, it's a bad idea. I just want to be clear. I can't imagine what Auschwitz does to you, because Auschwitz was probably five times worse than Dachau. And I, I was traumatized. Like, it wasn't like I walked out of there going, man, that was sad. Like, I, I probably needed therapy after that. <clears throat> so Germany has a Muslim population. And those Muslims had to go with the rest of the students, because they're not going to discriminate just because you're not, you know, Protestant or Catholic. Because let's be honest, right? the Nazis were Protestants and Catholics. They weren't Muslim. So the Muslims have to go too. And while those Muslim students were in Auschwitz, the, the Muslim, some of the Muslim uh, girls, because right, it's a high school thing, they're not adults, were wearing hijab. They had their hair covered. And while they were in Auschwitz, Poles were attacking them, ripping their hijab off, calling them names and punching them and being aggressive with them. And Chancellor Angela Merkel went, what are you doing? We're trying to teach our students that this type of behavior is offensive and not allowed, and you're doing it to them while they're at Auschwitz. Do you not see the irony? That's the rabbit hole Poland has fallen into. Now, some of you are going to be mad at me because you're going to be like, why am I picking on Poland? It's, it's just familiarity. I know more about Poland than I know about some of the other states. But let me point out the other states because they're worth pointing out. Uh, Hungary, Orban's party, Fidesz, they're totally Nazi too. In fact, in fact, at one point, one of the co-founders of the Law and Justice Party in Poland says, my goal is to make Warsaw another Budapest. In other words, he thought Fidesz and what Orban is doing in Hungary was his role model. That's what he was trying to achieve in Poland. Turkey, Erdogan, he's gone off the deep end. He's killed Turkey's democracy. So has is, so is Orban. He's killed Hungary's democracy. Narendra Modi, India, the BJP party, they believe that India is for Hindus only. India has a larger Muslim population than Pakistan does. India has Christians and Buddhists. India isn't just Hindu, it has Jains and Sikhs. Like the idea that India is for Hindus only is bizarre and ahistorical, and it's never been like that. And yet, that's the party that rules India. It has recently built enough concentration camps that they could house up to two million people. India is building concentration camps. India ended Kashmir's special status because it's cracking down on its Muslim minority population. Brazil, Bolsonaro is a Nazi. And you can go down the list. State after state has gone flying to the right. And democracy after democracy has either outright toppled or is in such horrible shape it's lost its status as a democracy. So let me give you another story of a, 
a lost democracy that went flying to the right. So in 1991, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics collapsed. It didn't just collapse, Russia seceded. So if you know the Soviet Union, you know that the Soviet Union was Russia's empire. It was Russia's communist empire, where it initially forced 14 other republics into a union with them, and then eventually, uh, just before they collapsed, they let the Baltic states go. So at the moment of collapse, they were down to 12 republics. And the way the Soviet Union collapsed is Russia withdrew, and once Ru Russia withdrew, <laughs> There was no reason for the other 11 members to stay. They didn't want to be in to begin with. One of those members, of course, is Ukraine. <clears throat> well, the guy who took over Russia in the aftermath was a guy named Boris Yeltsin. It turns out Boris Yeltsin was pretty dedicated. I said pretty dedicated. I didn't say totally dedicated. He's more or less dedicated to the idea of making Russia into a democracy, into a somewhat liberal, capitalist democracy. That was his program. He had limitations put on him by the oligarchs. Oh, I really should call them billionaires, because that's what we call our oligarchs, right? Because uh, it would be hypocritical if I referred to them as oligarchs when we don't refer to our oligarchs as oligarchs. It's so weird. Our little double think thing we always do. <laughs> so embarrassing. <clears throat> he had some limitations put on him because there was only so far he could go. And it's also worth pointing out, he wasn't exactly clean himself. In other words, he and his family, and I mean that both figuratively and in actuality, were, had their hands in the till and were taking a little bit more of Russia's money than his salary, if you know what I mean. He wasn't over the top insane corrupt, but probably about like just about any American politician. Just sort of a moderate level of corruption. You know what I mean? And he was talented enough that he wasn't being busted for it. He wasn't like a Blagojevich, the governor of Illinois who went down on a ball of flames um, because he was over the top corrupt. Right? It's, in the United States, it's okay to be stupid, it's okay to be corrupt, it's not okay to be corrupt and stupid. That's too far for us. We don't, that's, and that loves Blagojevich. I, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong about this, but it's such a fun stat, I have to say it. At the time Blagojevich was imprisoned, he was the fourth of seven Illinois governors, seven in a row, he was the fourth to go to prison. Is that cool? <laughs> Illinois, Ill oh, actually, you know what that probably suggests? Illinois has better law enforcement. Because I bet if we did this in Texas or Louisiana or Alabama or Mississippi, it would be way more than four sevenths of our governors going to prison. Anyway, Georgia, Georgia. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about Boris Yeltsin is he also had an extended group of billionaires, I almost said oligarchs, billionaires, that he called the family, and they also needed his protection. And so there was sort of like this understanding that he would continue to sort of develop Russia's move towards capitalist, liberal democracy, but at the same time, he needed to protect his allies, who are oligarchs. And in the middle of all of this, a guy comes out of nowhere. He comes out of total obscurity. His name is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was a KGB agent. He was a spy. But I don't want you to think James Bond. He was more like Money Penny. Not the new Money Penny, who's actually out there in the field with a, and shooting people. I mean the old Money Penny, where she just sits behind a desk and flirts with James. Right? That's what Vladimir Putin was. He was just a paper pusher. But he was in East Germany. He spoke German. <coughs> and when the wall was coming down, the thought going through Putin's mind was, all right, when is the army going to go in there and murderize these Germans and put them back in their place? And the wall goes down, and the military never goes out and murderizes. You've got to remember, 89, that's when Tiananmen Square happened. So just a few months before the wall went down, the Chinese put down their democracy movement with extreme violence. 
And so a lot of people were thinking this was going to happen in Eastern Europe. <clears throat> um, and it doesn't happen. And Putin's beside himself. He can't, he can't figure out what's going on. Why isn't this happening? And he, and he says, he kept calling Moscow, asking for orders. I don't know if that's true and who cares if it's true. He, what he says then is he got no reply. And at least in his reality, R Russia was kind of gone in that moment. And then, of course, the Soviet Union collapses two years later in 1991. At that moment, he calls up R the Soviet Union, he calls up Moscow, and he's like, what are my orders? And there's no answer. And so he basically hitchhikes, because he's unemployed in East Germany, this Russian spy, and he, he doesn't know what to do, so he hitch hitchhikes to his hometown. His hometown was Leningrad, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, it got renamed St. Petersburg, which was its original name. Right? It was St. Petersburg, then it became Petrograd, then it became Leningrad, and now it's St. Petersburg again. He goes back to St. Petersburg, and he gets a job, by luck, in the mayor's office, and he, what he is, is he's a bureaucrat. Putin was a, he was a bureaucrat in the KGB, he's a bureaucrat now in the mayoral office. That, that's what he was, and he was really good at it. And that's exactly what the Russians needed in that moment. They needed people who were decent, at least, at paper pushing, because they, they were trying to recover, they were trying to bounce back from the Soviet Union's collapse and, and recreate a functioning state. And so he moves up the ranks really fast in the mayoral office, and then something really strange happens. The mayor himself gets in serious trouble. And instead of Putin taking advantage of that situation and selling the man out and earning cred with the guys taking the mayor out, he escapes the mayor from St. Petersburg. He does something really strange. He, 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 he takes the losing side and he shows his loyalty to the mayor in this moment. The mayor was a dedicated democracy advocate. And so here's this also this really weird moment where Putin, he's never probably fully on board with this democracy project that Yeltsin was on, that the mayor was on. <clears throat> and yet, when push came to shove, he, he was loyal to a guy he may not have actually fully agreed with, which showed that he was, he was a team player. He was the deputy mayor at that point. And I think that's the moment when Boris Yeltsin notices him. Because at that moment then, Yeltsin is thinking, my days are numbered. How do I replace myself with somebody who maybe is a loyal team player and will protect my family, both the literal family and his, his friends, his billionaire, entrepreneur, billionaire friends who were destroying the Russian economy and stealing everything for themselves so they could have yachts. You know what I mean. Those guys. And so the next thing you know, out of nowhere, Putin becomes prime minister. <clears throat> and then Putin is he's prime minister at a really important moment. So Russia is having trouble because there's a breakaway province and it's Chechnya. And the breakaway province actually beat Russia in a war, which was humiliating. Here's this tiny little enclave of Russia. Tiny, tiny little enclave. I don't even think it's the size of, of Massachusetts, right? Like the enclave the size of Connecticut. It whoops Russia. It forces Russia to accept it as a de facto independent state. And Putin is trying to fix this because it's a point of pride for him. And he comes up with a plan. And he gets the plan approved by Boris Yeltsin. And the plan is to send money to the Chechens. And then sell weapons to the Chechens using the money they sent them. And the thinking was it would arm the Chechens and it would make the Chechens aggressive. And then the Chechens would attack Russia because they would want to expand their territorial claim to Dagestan a next door neighbor Muslim enclave of Russia. And then that would give the Russians casus belli, it would give them cause for war. And so they start doing this. They're funding the Chechens, they're funding the Chechens. Sure enough, the Chechens invade Dagestan. And then, almost like a miracle, 
a series of bombs explode in multiple apartment buildings in this little town, middle of nowhere, Russia. <laughs> Hundreds of Russians die. Russia immediately blames it on the Chechens. They then invade Chechnya, that is invaded Dagestan, and they whoop it in the Second Chechen War. And the Chechens fought really hard, and so the Russians brought in thermobaric bombs and basically killed everybody living in Grozny and forced the Chechens to, to surrender, the, sur the survivors to surrender. Yeltsin, in, on December 31st, 1999, like talk about dramatic, gets on the TV and he says, he's teary-eyed, he's upset, he looks exhausted. And he says, I'm resigning. I'm done as your president. You're going to have to have a new guy. I'm tired. I'm not old. My health is falling apart. I'm, I'm out of here. He handpicks Putin to be the new guy. The first thing Putin does once he's in office is he goes after two oligarchs, Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Gusinsky. Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Gus Gusinsky have one thing in common. They both own TV stations. What Putin realizes is if you control the TV stations, you control Russia. And so he decides his goal now is to take these two TV stations by force from these two oligarchs. I forget exactly how he gets the one TV station of, away from Borozovsky, but the way he gets the Gusinsky TV station, it's NTV. NTV had a puppet show on it, and the puppet show would have, they had a puppet of Boris Yeltsin, right? They had a puppet of Vladimir Putin. They had all these, all these political puppets, and then they would have them talk, and they were not flattering. This was pure mockery. And Yeltsin put up with it because this was part of his democratization program. He didn't mind. He was thick-skinned. But Putin, it drives Putin bonkers. So Putin has Gusinski arrested. Gusinski is sitting in prison for trumped-up charges. This is total BS, Not, nothing real about any of this. And then Putin has an ally go meet with Gusinski in prison. And the ally tells Gusinski, point blank, you're facing years in prison, but I can get you out. And Gusinski goes, what do I do? And, he, and they say, you sell NTV to Gazprom Media. Gazprom is the gas company, not the oil company. That's Rusnaft. Gazprom. And you sell it to Gazprom Media, and we're good. You walk out of here. No more time in prison. And Gusinski sells. And now, Yeltsin, now Putin has the TV stations. And that's the beginning of the end of the Russian experiment in democracy. Presidential terms were four years long. And things go downhill right away in that first term. By the way, the next year, 2001, we get an ugly surprise, 9-11. Now, it wasn't as much of a surprise as we like to pretend it was, in part because, I mean, there's only so many times you can bat a hornet's nest before you should expect the hornets to bite you. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I think that's just reasonable. But also because the Israeli and Egyptian intelligence services the week before 9-11 happened alerted us that 9-11 was going to happen. And then the Bush administration, either because it's incompetent or because it wanted it to happen, didn't actually respond correctly to prevent 9-11 from taking place. Something to sort of note. In any case, I think it's more likely they were incompetent, but never rule out another possible thing until you've had a way to prove one way or the other. In any case, in, Yeltsin, in, sorry, in Putin's mind, this is the moment the United States is going to join Russia because in, in Putin's mind, Russia is in this life and death war against Islam. And now the United States is in a life and death war against Islam. And it is a war against Islam. It's not a war against Muslim terrorists who are Chechen. 
It's a war against the religion itself. At one point, uh, um, as the numbers are coming in from the Grozny massacre with the thermobaric bombs, by that point, by the way, Putin's already president when they're doing the thermobaric bombs on Grozny. Uh, uh, a journalist stands up and he asks, you've killed how many people in Grozny? This is, this is a war crime, I think. And Putin's response is, if you want to be circumcised, come to Moscow and we'll circumcise you. We have experts in it. <sighs> Talking about non sequitur. <laughs> like, what the hell? What? What's happening here? I missed something. But that's who Putin is. He was showing his true colors right away, early on. There, there should have been no surprise to anybody about what happens next. Bush meets with him. When he meets with him, he's asked, Bush is asked by the press. They're at a press conference. Putin's standing here, Bush is standing here. A journalist asks Bush, how do you feel about Putin? And here's what Bush says. He says, I looked him in the eyes and I saw into his soul. And, I, and he's a man we can work with. And of course, <laughs> it's like really, it was such a, an amazing statement how did you see into his soul? What kind of eyesight do you have exactly? Are you Superman? And it's this moment where everybody kind of knew that Bush might be a moron, but it, now it was hard to deny it. In 2003, something terrible happens. Georgia has a revolution called the Rose Revolution. Anything to do with flowers, obviously, you know it's going to be awful, just awful. What Georgia does is it drops Shevardnadze and it replaces him, uh, I have the name in my, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me later. It replaces him with a pro-democracy leader and the way, and the way this pro-democracy democracy leader triggers the Rose Revolution is he and his followers walk into Georgian parliament carrying roses. And that starts this revolution that results in Georgia becoming um, a democracy. Putin freaks out because in his mind, Georgia is part of Russia's sphere of influence. So to have one of, the, one of the former Soviet states go democratic so close to Russia is upsetting. It, it touches Russia, it borders Russia. And then the next year, something else terrible happens. <clears throat> There's an election and the election is between uh, two Ukrainians. One guy is Viktor Yushchenko, and the other guy is Viktor Yanukovych. And I don't, if that bothers you, it drove me nuts too. I, it took me a long time to get it, get it straight in my head. I got it straight in my head. Viktor Yushchenko was a pro-US, pro-European Union politician. Viktor Yanukovych was a Russian agent, pro-Russian. In the, as they're doing the election, the Russians poison Yushchenko. He happened to be in Europe at the time, lucky for him. He actually ends up having to be flown to Vienna, Austria, because they have a special unit for dealing with dioxin poisoning, and they, they barely save his life. When he comes out of the hospital, he looks 25 years older, like the poison just really damaged him. He ends up winning the election after a series of protests and demonstrations against Yanukovych cheating. That's called the Orange Revolution. And at that moment, if there was any doubt about the direction Ukraine wanted to go in, because there was, there was a serious authoritarian tendency in the Ukraine. In that moment now, it becomes clear that Ukrainians do probably want a democracy. And then the next year, there's the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan. And Kyrgyzstan tries to go democratic. In 2008, there is uh, rice riots in Egypt. And those rice riots in Egypt were sort of the precursor riots that would lead to the Arab Spring just three years later, two years later. And, and Putin is watching all of this. In the meantime, the United States attacks Iraq. In 2003, Putin's tearing his hair out, going, stop attacking Iraq, why are you doing this? And of course, Bush is doing it because he wants to do regime change. And in Putin's mind, no, you don't do regime change on a secular state. 
You don't do a regime change on an ally. Saddam Hussein is a U.S. and a Russian ally. You don't attack allies, you attack enemies. We need to go after these Muslim fundamentalists, not these secular tyrants who are like me. And so he's feeling seriously alienated from the United States. He starts to get paranoid and he comes to believe that the Rose Revolution and the Orange Revolution and the Tulip Revolution are actually staged by the United States. That, that we're, we're heading in a direction where the United States is probably going to do a regime change on him. In the meantime, the United States does a couple of really nasty things that set Ukraine up for this war. In 1994, we talked Ukraine out of its nuclear weapons with security assurances. It's called the Budapest uh, Memorandum on Security Assurances. And what we said was, if you give up your nukes, we will come to your aid if Russia ever attacks you. Oops, uh, oops, uh, oops. <laughs> oh well, we broke our word again, again. If that wasn't enough, we do another really big mistake in 2008. In 2008, at Bucharest in Romania, there is a NATO conference, a NATO summit. And at the summit, the United States, George Bush Jr., is insisting that, that, that Ukraine become a NATO member. But the, the NATO doesn't want Ukraine to join because they're worried it'll antagonize the Russians. The compromise they come up with is that they're going to make a declaration that Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO. They will join NATO. In return, they won't. So there will be a declaration that they will, but the compromise is that they won't. Okay? It's the worst possible thing to do in that moment. Either declare they won't and don't let them in, or declare they will and then let them in. Don't declare they will and then don't let them in. At that point, you're better off declaring they won't and then let them in. <laughs> and the reason it's the worst possible outcome is because now it's in Putin's mind that at some point down the road, Ukraine and Georgia are going to join NATO. His response is the following. There were two breakaway territories in Georgia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. He the Russians were supporting both. He tells the South Ossetians to begin an artillery barrage in Georgia against U Georgian forces. The President Shakashvili, there he, I got it, Shakashvili, that, <laughs> I knew I'd get it eventually if I stopped thinking about it. The President of Georgia um, goes to George Bush Jr. and he says, hey, we've got a really weird problem here, it's really, really awkward. We've got a breakaway territory attacking us. We, we really just want to re-annex it. We want to go in there and conquer it and put it back into Georgia. But we don't dare do this unless we know the United States has our back because if we attack South Ossetia, even though they're attacking us, the Russians will, will come after us. Georgia, uh, George Bush Jr. goes, yeah, yeah, we've got your back. If you go after South Ossetia, don't you worry about it. Georgia attacks South Ossetia. The Russians start pouring over the border and they're tearing the Georgians to pieces. Shakashvili is like, all right, where's the aid? You, you promised to back us. And what we did was we loaded up Georgian soldiers who were in Iraq fighting for us in the Iraq war onto planes and flew them to Georgia. And Shakashvili's like, okay, where's the aid? And Bush goes, that's it. He goes, oh, your aid was to send our soldiers to die? No, 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 we need you to come to our aid. And that's it, we just walked away. We set Georgia up to get attacked by Russia and then just walked away. In 2007, before this even happened, Putin made a speech where he was in front of the European Union and NATO members and he called out the United States especially but he also attacked the European Union and he said Russia can't feel safe under these circumstances. You're too aggressive. You're pushing on Russia's borders. And there might be truth to that. <clears throat> but there also might be some paranoia too. In any case, Russia had a two-term limit. In other words, 
Putin's done in 2008. He needs, to, he needs to step down. He steps down, and then Medvedev, his, his ally, becomes the new president of Russia, and then Putin becomes the new prime minister. In other words, Medvedev and Putin switch places. So now Medvedev is the guy running Russia as the president, and Putin's the number two man. At the end of the four-year term, <clears throat> Medvedev gets up in front of the Russian people and he's crying and he says, I'm not running for another term, I'm done. And the Russian people go, oh, this was all a scam. It's Putin all along, he's been pulling Medvedev's strings all along. But here's the crazy thing, while Medvedev was president, he had loosened up strict restrictions on Russia and allowed more freedom of press, more news media freedom. There were protests and he allowed them to be in the streets. And so Putin wants to get back into the presidency to, to reverse all of that and send Russia back into the authoritarian direction he wanted it in all along. So Putin's running in 2012. There's over the top cheating in the election. People take to the streets and they're protesting. And in the middle of the protests, one year after the Arab Spring, Russia is thinking the Arab Spring has come to Russia. Because you've got to remember the Arab Spring wasn't just in, in the Arab world. It went pan-global. It started in the Arab world. And it's easier to name the countries that it didn't go to than it is to name the countries that it did. It even came to the United States. In the United States, the Arab Spring was called Occupy. Right? Uh, the, original, the original Arab Spring in the United States is when Democrats took over the Madison, Wisconsin, uh, legislature, the building, the Capitol building, they took it over. There were people in, in downtown Cairo holding up signs and it said the people of, of Egypt stand with the people of Wisconsin <laughs> as the Arab Spring was going pan-global. <clears throat> Putin wins the election, takes office, changes the Constitution, makes it so that the terms are six years long and there's no more term limits. He abolishes the ability for the Russian people to elect the, their own provincial governors. They're now appointed by Putin and he establishes an authoritarian state again. And he, he deletes any attempt that the Russians had to, to be a democracy. In his last election, uh, which was in 2018 now that there's six year terms, uh, the, there were people walking into the phone booths with their phones and just recording the cheating. And the cheating is just over the top. Like they're literally grabbing pre-filled out ballots and, and stuffing them. And so there's like no doubt anymore that Russia is no longer a democracy in any way, shape or form. Anything that Yeltsin had tried to do is gone. Uh, pretty recently, I want to say 2016, 2015, the United Russia Party, Boris, uh, sorry, I keep doing that, <laughs> Vladimir Putin's party, uh, the United Russia Party, declared an ideology. So not all political parties have an ideology. For the longest time, the Democratic and the Republican parties were unideological. They were umbrella parties. You just, it, it didn't matter what you believed. You, you, you became a member because you just wanted, you liked their logo, I don't know, something. Something brought you to that party, but it wasn't ideology. The United Russia Par Party, uh, about six years ago, declared an ideology finally. And what they declared was that they were Russian conservatives. So if there was any doubt that the Russian, the United Russia Party, whether it was left wing or right wing, it's over now. It is a right wing party. That is its official position. In other words, this trend towards the right is linked really dramatically with <clears throat> anti-LGBT rights policies and anti-women policies and authoritarianism. They are interconnected. Let me tell you another story. But before I do, I need to pace myself, so let me just do double check my time. <clears throat> so, there was a really important question that was being asked in 1932 in the United States. And that really important question was, how were we going to proceed now that we were in the Great Depression? What was the next step? So before 1932, 
If you were conservative or you were liberal, it didn't quite exactly mean what it means today, but you can see the seeds of what it meant, what it means today. So the conservatives before 1932 were people who believed that capitalism was perfect in its pure form. So perfect, in fact, that many conservatives believed that the invisible hand moving the economy, that the concept of supply and demand, was actually God. It was actually Jesus Christ himself intervening in the economy and designating the price of rice and sugar and cars and refrigerators. He's a very busy guy. That's how seriously they took capitalism. So when the economy tanked, the conservatives believed the way we got out of that, the way we got out of the Great Depression, was we let it go its course, and we let people suffer, and we let the economy be ruined. And, and eventually, the economy would correct itself in a sort of economic Darwinistic way, with Jesus' guidance, maybe, because some of them were religious. Most of them weren't. They didn't care. But there was a group that did believe this. And that eventually we would have this really super strong, robust economy on the other side. But whatever we did, we needed to stay out of the economy. Because too much interference in the economy might also unhinge the balance, the careful balance that had been established, where there was this tiny elite that had a fabulous amount of wealth, and the rest of the country was basically in poverty. And what that did was that kept down labor prices, because now labor was competing with labor for the, for the jobs. And if you allowed for too much wealth to enter into the economy, you might end up with too much of a middle class, which would have too much bargaining power over its wages, and it would drive up the value of labor. The conservatives kind of saw the economy as a zero-sum game. That if, if a poor person had $10, that was $10 out of a rich person's pocket. The liberals didn't see it that way. They saw it as a feedback loop. That as the economy got stronger and more people had money, more people would buy products which would make the co companies richer, which would allow them to pay their workers more, which would then grow the economy and it would allow people to buy more products which would, make, which would go back to the companies, which would make the companies richer so they would expand the economy more. So they, the liberals saw the intervention in the economy as a good thing because they saw it as a way to stimulate growth of the economy. They were both completely dedicated to capitalism. It's just the liberals thought you should do things to manipulate the economy to stimulate growth, whereas the conservatives believed you shouldn't. So when the economy tanks, it's a huge repudiation of both liberals and conservatives because there is no light at the end of the tunnel. In 1932, there was no evidence that we were coming out of the Depression anytime soon. In fact, it was getting worse, not better. And so what FDR does is he basically talks liberals into an adjustment to their ideology. And here's the adjustment. If we don't intervene in the economy right now, maybe we won't Maybe the intervention isn't enough to fix the economy and get us back on track, but the intervention will be enough to mitigate some of the worst effects of the economy so people don't suffer so much. If we don't do this right now, the United States is going to have a socialist revolution. And if we get really unlucky, it might even go communist. Right? Because you've got to remember, the Russians had a socialist revolution in March called the February Revolution of 1917. And then they had a communist revolution that took out the socialist government in November called the October Revolution. And so, right, the liberals begin panicking. They're like, that could come here. That was, that was just 15 years earlier. And, and in fact, socialists were winning races. For example, the mayor of Milwaukee went socialist. And, and there was movement in that direction. The United States was becoming red. And so what the 1932 election is, is it's a, it's a contest between the conservatives who believe we should just let the Great Depression work its way out, and the liberals who are saying, no, the only way we're stopping from going socialist is if we directly intervene. And the liberals won out. 
So what the liberals did was they hired socialists like James Maynard Keynes to come in and muck around with the economy with the goal of preventing socialism. It was like a vaccination. We're going to give you a little bit of the virus that we don't want you to be overrun by. Here's a little bit of socialism. Here's social security. They didn't have to call it social security. They could have called it financial security. They could have called it retirement security. They could have called it old age security. They intentionally used words that they thought would kind of feed the system and, and mollify the working class. And then they did direct intervention on things like banking regulation and the FDIC. And, other, and they do things like the CCC where they, they create fake jobs, which by the way I'm very grateful for, so that they can, they can stimulate the economy. I'm grateful because if you've ever walked a trail in a national park, odds are good it was built by the CCC. If you've ever been to the river walk in San Antonio, it was built by the CCC. In other words, we got some really great stuff out of that. It was not, it was not I mean, they were fake jobs, but they were, it was worth it. It's fantastic. <clears throat> An unexpected side effect in combination with World War II, of course. It wasn't just the policies that the liberals had implemented when they took over in, 30, in, in the 32 election. The, the, there were, in combination with World War II, there was an unintended side effect. We ended up with the most robust economy in human history. We ended up with the greatest economy the world has ever seen. And it went from 1948 to 1973. It lasted 25 years. It was such an amazing economy, you could get a job and become rich. That has not been possible since, and it was never possible before. Since or before, the only way you became rich was you either A, were born rich, or B, married into a rich family, or C, won the lottery. <laughs> right? Don't get me wrong, there's Carnegie to be the example of the rags to riches story, but that's the end of my number. I mean, I'm sure there's got to be somebody else who did this. It's so rare in any case that you couldn't expect it. But there was so much money in the economy. Our economy was so robust that you could expect as a member of the working class that you would advance and you could change class. It was interesting time period. Our economy was so robust, we had a a thing called Bell Labs. You could get a job out of college, you could go to Bell Labs, and your job was to think of problems. Just to sit around and think up problems. And then when you came up with a problem that needed solving, you probably didn't have the solution, you just came up with a problem. You would write it up and you would post it on a board. And then other people working in, in Bell Labs could go to the board, they could post their own problems they came up with, and they would read the other problems, and if you felt like it, you could try to work out a solution for a problem. And they, they were just literally paying people to make the world a better place. Can you imagine? Like today, the pharmaceutical companies put more money into advertising than they put into researching new drugs. They're the exact opposite. Their only goal is to make profit. They don't care about the future. They don't even care about the future of their own corporation. Their only goal is to make profit right here, right now. Let alone to think of some problem. Let me tell you one of the problems. It's actually quite fascinating to me, this, this thinking of problems. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the dominant theory in science is there was a big explosion about 13 billion years ago. And that explosion created the universe. And the universe has been expanding ever since. Well, we can hear it. That's one of the reasons why we think there was a big bang, is we can hear it. It's still roaring. It was such a big explosion 13 billion years later, it's still, there's still background noise. It isn't, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even understand. Like, it's, it's way past me. Well, 
because we can hear it, if I send an electronic signal down a wire from, from Austin to New York City, that noise, that background radiation noise is going to hit that wire and it's going to corrupt any data I send. So I have to have an algorithm that, that a computer will use to weed out the noise to keep my data stream from being corrupted. And those are the types of things they were thinking up and trying to figure out. <clears throat> Isn't that crazy? Love that. Is, wouldn't it be cool if we had that? To, I know the university is supposed to do that, but we all know that's not true. So, at least maybe they think up the problem, but they don't think up the solution, that's for sure. <laughs> they just, right, because in the university system, you want to publish. So you come up with an issue, you write an article, it takes you two or three years to publish it. By the time you publish it, it's irrelevant. It's two or three years later, no one cares. 17 people read your stupid article and somehow your career advanced. It's, what a waste of time. In any case, something amazing happens in the middle of this. In the middle of this massive economic expansion. People who were categorized as outsiders suddenly say, oh, wait a minute, no, I want civil rights and I want a share of the pie. And of course, we understand this as the civil rights movement because black people are at the forefront of this. And black people end up producing this mass demonstration movement that starts in the 50s and ends up being the 60s. It evolves into the 60s. And we call it the 60s. And it was a revolutionary moment in our history. And that revolutionary moment resulted in actual change. Now, it wasn't perfect by any means. We're still a fully racist society. We're still totally segregated. Our schools are segregated. Our neighborhoods are segregated. Our churches are segregated. Our radio stations are segregated. Like we've got a long way to go still. But the Civil Rights Act was not a joke. It had a meaningful impact on people's lives. The Voting Rights Act was not a joke. It had a meaningful impact on people's lives. There were some serious gains made in the middle of that movement. Of course, the Civil Rights Act is 1964. So remember, I said the Democratic Party and the Republican Party were unideological parties. Most Democrats were either liberals or conservatives. Most Republicans were either liberals, conservatives, what we would today call libertarians, or populists. In other words, the two parties were these totally giant umbrella parties that had no ideological connection to what they did or said or believed. There were moments when one party or the other would, would express one ideology more than the other, but that was largely a result of the candidate who was running for office. So, the candidate running for office in 1964 for the Republican Party is a guy named Barry Goldwater. 1964 is the year LBJ <coughs> signs the Civil Rights Act. So Barry Goldwater runs saying, if you elect me, I will get rid of the Civil Rights Act. Barry Goldwater gets destroyed in one of the biggest electoral victories in U.S. history. LBJ puts him down, using LBJ's language like a beat dog. But Barry Goldwater does win five states. He wins his home state, Arizona, and then he wins Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Those five states were fanatically loyal to the Democratic Party. This is the first time they vote Republican. Well, uh, some of those states voted for Eisenhower. This is the first time some of those states have voted Republican since the end of the Civil War, since the Republican Party came into being. And so the result is this earthquake in Democratic politics 
that these fanatic states, these fanatically loyal democratic states, are all of a sudden voting for this Republican. For one reason and one reason alone, he's promising to get rid of the Civil Rights Act. Four years later, it's going to be Nixon versus Humphrey. The 1968 election was an unpopularity election. We have those from time to time. 2016, of course, is the other big unpopularity contest, where the two parties pick pretty much the two worst people they could imagine to run. Right? Nobody liked Humphrey, and nobody liked Nixon. Nobody liked Clinton, and nobody liked Trump. It was insane. I know eventually people fell in love with Trump. But a huge chunk of the Republican Party wanted nothing to do with him. This, there, there was this, the, these two elections were these moments where they were these really wildly unpopular candidates. And the Republicans knew who Nixon were, was. This was. He didn't come out of nowhere. He had been vice president for Eisenhower for eight years. In fact, Eisenhower almost dumped Nixon in 1964. I'm sorry, 1956. He almost dumped Nixon. He went to him and he said, I, I don't think I want you to be my VP for my second term. And basically, Nixon fell on his knees and begged him. And for some reason, Eisenhower caved in. In 1968, then, there's a, it's a referendum again on civil rights. Now, to make things more complicated, there's a Dixiecrat candidate. His name is George Corley-Wallace. He is the governor of Alabama. He is featured in the song Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinner. They say everybody loves the governor. They mean George Carla Wallace. George Carla Wallace, as a third party candidate, is going to win five states, five loyally democratic states. And he's going to take those votes away from Humphrey. In fact, He's going to win votes in the rest of the country, too, not just those five states. And he takes votes away from Humphrey. So the Democrats now have this problem of having this third party candidate stealing votes. The five states he wins, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, not South Carolina. He won Arkansas, just to shake things up. And it's part of the reason Humphrey loses. Humphrey actually only lost by 0.7 percentage points in popular vote. He, he lost big in electoral college delegates. I'm not an expert on the 1968 election, but I, I am under the impression that had Wallace not run, he probably would have won the electoral college. Humphrey would have probably won the electoral college. That Wallace definitely cost him the election. That and the fact that Humphrey was such an odious person. So the Democrats win one of their biggest blowout elections in 64, and then four years later lose by a narrow, narrow margin to Nixon, a guy we knew he had been VP for eight years. We, we were familiar with who Nixon was. And the reason he won was the same reason the Law and Justice Party was created in Poland. The reason he won was white people went, wait a minute, does this mean we have to share the wealth with black people? Not all white people did this, obviously, but just enough white people asked themselves that question and decided to vote for Nixon because they knew that Nixon was going to do the following when he was in office. He was going to pursue the interests of the rich at the expense of the middle class and the lower class. He was going to pursue conservative policies that were not civil rights friendly. He was going to crack down on activist organizations that had been fighting for civil rights. There were white, enough white people who decided that they were going to reject the civil rights project, and Nixon was their vehicle for doing it. Even if it meant hurting their own position to do it. Even if it meant they, as poor whites or working class whites, would be disadvantaged by a Nixon administration, it was OK because their mindset was it was a zero sum game. And that $10 that black family had was $10 their white family didn't. So, to make sure that the black family didn't have the $10, 
they were going to make sure nobody did. Well, the oligarchs would have it. And that's exactly what Nixon does. He ends the liberal economic boom. By 1973, it stops. And if you look at all the socioeconomic vectors that you would want to measure, except for life expectancy. So, you know, right, your standard of living, cost of living, all those things. Uh, the level at which we're, we were polarized, the likelihood that a, the people of different races would get the same pay, the likelihood that uh, you, you had an equal chance at college education. The high water mark in the United States is 1973, not 2022. We have been going the wrong direction now since 1973 on every indicator, including now life expectancy. Over the last few years, life expectancy has turned around and is going the wrong direction. It took a while for life expectancy to catch up. I'll give you an example of what I mean. In 1973, the top 1%, the richest Americans, took away 8% of the economy. They pocketed 8%. So 1% walked away with 8%. By the way, for me, that doesn't seem outrageous. Right? I mean, it is, but perspective. Today, the top 1% walks away with 40% of all the wealth generated. Our oligarchs are plundering our labor. And they're pocketing the money. In real dollars, the level of income generated today for most professions is exactly the same or lower than it was in 1973. In other words, professors have not had an actual pay raise, a real pay raise, in 49 years by the time you put in inflation and cost of living. And then, there was the part-timeification of jobs. There was a period of time in the US where, where meatpacking industry jobs had a one-year wait list for an interview. Meatpacking. Who wants to do that? Who wants to be a butcher chopping animals up and saran wrapping them? And the answer was, they were such good jobs, with such good pay scales, with such good retirement packages, they, yeah, they weren't bad. One year wait list. Today, they're largely done by undocumented immigrants who have no minimum wage rights, no types of benefits, no retirement. And the job safety standards are hideous. The, the only place, ironically enough, the only meatpacking places where they have good job safety is where uh, McDonald's buys from. Because McDonald's is so worried about lawsuits, they insist that the quality of the, the animal chopping plant be high enough that they'll avoid lawsuits, crazily enough. I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it, that McDonald's is somehow the, the voice of reason in our country. Like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Thank God there's somebody. <laughs> Here's why. By the way, uh, this has happened at university positions. 76% of university professors are adjuncts. The average adjunct makes $15,000 a year. If you had a job that paid $7.50 an hour and you worked at 40 hours a week, you would make $15,000 a year. The average professor in the United States is a minimum wage employee. 76%. So airline pilots. This has been done to airline pilots. Like you think that's a cool ass job. Like who wouldn't want to do that? It turns out maybe if money is a thing, it's probably not your path to go down. So here's what happened. Nixon ends up going down in a ball of flames because he gets busted for cheating, which everybody knew he was doing. It's just he went too far. 
Um, I forget how many minutes. Does anybody remember how many minutes he erased in telephone conversations? Eight. eight. Okay, I had 18 in my head, but I felt like that was wrong. Eight. Eight minutes. Uh, how many minutes did Trump erase? I have 420 in my head. Does anybody, <laughs> does anybody know? Uh, anyway, it'll be fun to see if, if the Democrats do anything with that. They never will. No, I don't see it ever happening. I don't know what Merrick Garland is waiting for. I think he's waiting for Godot. Uh, Godot is not going to come, just for the record. He's, that's not his thing. He's just never going to show up. So if you're waiting for Godot, it's a long wait. Don't wait for Godot. He's, he kind of sucks, honestly, because he doesn't consider your time, and your time is valuable. Right? He's supposed to show up, but he doesn't. I don't, I don't understand. Anyway. Uh, Carter gets elected. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Jimmy Carter is he's the first of a brand new kind of president. In 1976, because of the 1968 election, we democratize the process by which we select the candidates to run for the two parties. Up until 1976, the two parties allowed the party bosses to pick the candidates. In 1976, the public in the primary votes for the candidate, and the guy who wins the primary becomes the candidate for that party. In other words, before 76, the Democrats would pick their guy, the Republicans would pick their guy, and in, in November, we'd pick between the two. After 76, seven Democrats would run, seven Republicans would run, and then we'd pick the Republican we liked, and then we'd pick the Democrat we liked, and then in November we'd pick between those two. In other words, in a really profound way, we became a democracy in 1976. Because up until that moment, it was kind of a show, right? The oligarchs picked their guy on one side, the oligarchs on the other side picked their guy, and then we picked between the two oligarchs guys. But there's a problem. So, uh, Michael Oakeshott, I'm going to invoke Michael Oakeshott. At least, if I leave the comments open on this, because this is going to end up on YouTube, I predict somebody's going to freak out on me for talking about Michael Oakeshott. Michael Oakeshott is a conservative philosopher. And one of the things that Michael Oakeshott points out is one of the big flaws in democracy. He says, democracy is terrible at picking good leaders. Because think about it. In a monarchy, you raise that person from day one to be the leader that you expect them to be. So you're training them, you're teaching them, you're cultivating them. If there's multiple kids, like let's say there's three and they're all heirs, you could assassinate the oldest one if it's not working out. You've got some control. You've got some control. Or, or get the oldest one to fall in love with an American divorcee and then abdicate so he can marry her. Whatever you need to do to get rid of that guy so that you can have a reasonable monarch, right? There's a mechanism there. You know what's coming. It's all predictable. It's all set up. And then the monarch is going to rule for 20, 40 years, probably. Not necessarily, but probably. And so you get this period of time of extraordinary predictability. But in a democracy, people come out of nowhere with little to no education or experience. And then suddenly, they're the most powerful human being on Earth. And Michael Oakeshott goes, what moron thinks this is a good idea? So when we become the democracy that we become in 76, there's a really big problem. Because up until 76, it was sort of this fake democracy where the guys who actually knew something about the candidates picked the candidate. Now all of a sudden, there's a population of people who are barely literate who are now in charge of picking the candidate for a political system for which they don't know anything about. They don't know any history, they can't add, they can barely read, and now all of a sudden, they're in charge of picking the most powerful human being on Earth. The news media tries to fill in the gap. They do. 
but they have a problem, and that is that they're profit-driven, so they have to be entertaining. So instead of diving deep and talking about the issues, they turn it into a daytime soap opera. And they treat it like it's a horse race. And then something also weird happens with us. By 1976, we had just enough distrust of government, maybe in part because of Nixon, that we decided we didn't really like insiders, and we start voting for outsiders. So Jimmy Carter is the first of these guys. He wasn't a true outsider. He was the governor of Georgia, but he was just the governor of Georgia. So in a really important way, he was very much an outsider. And then we picked Reagan, another outsider. He had been the governor of California, but I don't think he knew that. You know what I mean? Like he, his thing was to watch reruns of his best movie, Bedtime for Bonzo, while eating jelly beans. He was charismatic, but he wasn't all there. And he definitely didn't have experience enough to be president of the United States. He was just acting like he was president of the United States, and he wasn't really doing a great job either. And then there was George Bush Sr. He was the head of the CIA before he became vice president for eight years. So he did have eight years of vice presidential experience, which is good, better than the other two guys. But it would have been nice if he had done something other than CIA also, you know, secretary of something along the way, or, or been in the White House staff, or elected to another seat. And then came Clinton, governor of Arkansas, Again, great. Governors are wonderful. I'm not trying to trash governors. But it would have been great if he did something else meaningful to give him some, some serious experience, to have made him into a little bit of an insider so he knew what he was doing. Obama had been senator for, what, two years? And then all of a sudden he's president of the United States? Boom! Talk about coming out of nowhere. I miss Junior. He's so easy to forget. Junior, governor of Texas for six years. And again, yeah, that's not the worst start for your political career, but wouldn't it have been great if he was something else also along the way? <laughs> like, wouldn't it have been great if he had, I don't know, 25 years of political experience before we made him president? And then, Trump never elected to anything. One of the worst businessmen in human history. I don't think he knows what planet he lives on. If he has a 75 IQ, I will be shocked. And then Biden, 47 years of experience when we elected him. Biden is the first insider since Nixon. We have literally not elected an insider president in half a century. Now, again, I get it. It comes from a place of distrust. And I'm a firm believer you should distrust the government. I think the only way the government is ever kept honest is if you keep after them and assume everything they tell you is a lie and check it up yourself. And hold them to it. And when they lie, punish them for it. Which would have been really hard to do with Trump, because he lied, what was it, 20,000 times by the time he was done with his four years? Uh, Washington Post and various other news organizations kept track. They have the official number. It was some ridiculous, I think it was like 12 times a day. First of all, how did he find time? Oh my god, what a workaholic that guy is. How do you sit there and come up with 12 lies a day for four years? I would have been exhausted to the point of suicidalness. Like, I can't do it. I can't lie one more time. I'm going to pop a pill and kill myself like Hitler did. But no, he made it to four years. I'm so proud of him. It's incredible. He wants to go again and will in 2024. He'll get reelected. It's almost certain. It'll be weird, though, when he's doing, being sworn in from prison. Anyway, <laughs> he's not going to prison. He's a white man. That'll never happen. <laughs> it, oh, well. What are you going to do? So, Reagan. Reagan comes along. And he says, we need to make America great. Not again, just, just the first time. We need to make it great, period. And that's where he stopped. And I'm that guy. And he came across his grandpa. And we just got out of a humiliating, stunning defeat 
itty bitty teeny weeny little Vietnam had just beaten the snot out of us. And we were reeling from that. And then on top of that, we were reeling from the Iran hostage crisis. And on top of that, we were reeling from the stun of an oil shock in 1979, which came on the heels of an oil shock in 1973. And the country really did feel a little bit bad about itself. And this comes on the heels of the civil rights movement, where a bunch of white people were reassessing their loyalty to the idea that everybody was created equal. And then Reagan comes along, a guy who was careful not to come across as openly racist, but everybody kind of knew. You know what I mean? Like there is this thing. We now have the recordings of their conversations, like when he calls African leaders monkeys when he's talking to Nixon when he was governor of California. Um, and so we now have the proof of how racist he was. To give you an idea where Reagan was, when the country had turned on apartheid and the American public and the American Congress wanted to, to put sanctions on, apart, on apartheid South Africa to, to try to break apartheid's economy so that they would, they would quit, he refused in the beginning. He wanted nothing to do with it. And he was really clear that he believed that whites should rule blacks. That, that what South Africa had, where the five million whites ruled the 30 million blacks, was actually a really good thing. And what eventually happened was the Republican Party told him, no, nah, this is done. We are turning against apartheid. You are coming with us whether you like it or not. You're the leader of the party. This is, this is how this is going to turn out. And he was dragged, kicking and screaming into this. What Reagan did was he codified a shift in American politics that was really dramatic. He villainized the liberal period. The liberal period had gone from 1933 to 1981. He villainized it to the point where he would even say stuff like, oh, I'm not going to say the L word, the L word being liberal, because it's dirty. And then, he, and then he, he fractured the two political parties and he said the conservative party is the Republican party and the liberal party is the Democratic party. And all of a sudden a bunch of people start to realign politically because they went, oh wait a minute, I'm in the wrong party. I didn't know that's how it was. And they find themselves walking over to the other party and joining because they're like, well, I am a liberal and somehow I was a Republican or I'm a conservative and somehow I was a Democrat. I didn't get the memo. And then on top of it, Reagan does something else. He's villainizing the news media. He's not the first president to do that. Nixon do, did that. Nixon would constantly go off on how the news media hated him. They were against him. They were a conspiracy against him. Reagan does the same thing and he goes after him. And then Reagan does something else. He busts unions. And when we start, he starts going after unions. In fact, it's one of the first things he does. He goes after PATCO. PATCO was the air traffic controller union. He fired them. He fired the air traffic controllers. And the message he's sending is, the, the age of unions are, is over. I'm going to go after the unions. I'm going to try and break the unions because I want cheap labor back in the United States. The Reagan administration, Donald Regan, R-E-G-A-N, -E as opposed to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> can, you imagine, can you believe that guy was actually in the Reagan administration? Like that, that had to be on purpose. <laughs> anyway, Donald Regan actually in 1983 brought a bunch of CEOs together in a hotel and they did a conference. And in the conference, he told them, move production to China. Now you go, well, what good does that do? The, the CEOs went, well, if we do, we'll have these enormous transportation costs. And Donald Reagan said, yes, and it will be expensive, at least in the beginning, especially as you're establishing those factories in China. But then once you do, you won't have to worry about environmental costs and labor costs and job safety costs, and you'll end up saving a crap ton of money on labor. And most importantly, once the jobs are gone in the United States, the unions in the United States will be broken. Because if there's no job, there's no union. 
And so the Reagan administration deliberately deindustrialized, at least started the process of deindustrialization of the United States. After he was endorsed originally by most of the unions. After he was endorsed by a bunch of the unions, absolutely. He himself had been a, a, a union president. He was the Screen Actor Guild president for, I think, seven years. So here he was, he, was, he himself had been part of a union and had actually been the, the, the union president for actors for Hollywood, and he turns on them. In addition, the Republicans pull off another really important coup d'etat. Part of the activism in the 1960s was the evangelical religious Christian community in the United States. Most evangelicals, starting back in the 19th century, when they read the New Testament, concluded Jesus was totally a pinko. He was totally red. That Jesus liked poor people and not so much rich people. Right, because Jesus does very clearly say, ain't no chance in hell any rich folk coming here. Right? It's very clear. So in other words, what ends up happening is most evangelical Christians sided with the civil rights movement because they saw it as an extension of <clears throat> this idea that the poor should be taken care of, that we should have a more egalitarian society with better wealth distribution. But one of the things that happens in the 60s is <coughs> a bunch of premarital sex, rock and roll, people get tattoos, men wear their hair long, People are wearing sandals. People are wearing buckskin jackets and tie-dye and doing a lot of LSD and pot. And that freaks out those religious communities. They are not on board. And so in the aftermath of this, the Republicans go to them and say, hey, we have an idea. What's the number one thing <clears throat> that, that really motivates you that you want to see? And they said, we want to get rid of sin. And the Republicans go, we've got a bunch of cash. We'll fund your anti-sin movements if, if you abandon working for the poor. And the religious left, it wasn't called that, but that's what it was, gets transformed into the religious right. And they join the Republican Party. And they abandon poor activism. And they focus on fighting abortion. They focus on fighting against gay rights. They focus on fighting against women's rights. And they get heavily involved in politics. And there's a, there's a religious political movement that takes place in, in the 80s that some people call the Third Great Awakening that then launches into the 90s. And it has the result of polarizing the US population. They're, 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 the, the dialogue becomes you're either a patriot and a Christian, or you're an atheist and a communist, an atheist and a socialist. And you're either, you either love America or you hate it, and there's nothing in between. And then something else happens. <clears throat> Reagan and his people believed there was an illness plaguing the American public. And they call, there's two illnesses. One of the two illnesses they call the Vietnam Syndrome. They believed that Americans had achieved an unhealthy level of anti-war sentiment as a result of the humiliating rout of the Vietnam War. That we were unduly uninterested in warfare. And so what Reagan did was he spent his entire eight years trying to trigger a war that we could win. And he came up with it. It was called Lebanon. The Israelis had invaded Lebanon in 1982 and were on their way to capturing Beirut, the capital. In fact, they had entered, they, they were starting to enter Beirut. But Arab states were freaking out, going, at some point we're going to have to intervene. We can't just let the Israelis do this. So Reagan came up with a solution. We, the United States, France, Great Britain, and Italy, we would invade Beirut. We would conquer Beirut for the Israelis so that it wasn't the Israelis doing it. And we would occupy Beirut, and we would basically do Israel's dirty work for it in Lebanon. And then in the meantime, we would win, and the American public would get a taste of a victory in a war. So we go in, we successfully conquer Beirut, because they didn't fight back. And 
and we kept antagonizing the Italians because the Italians refused to send combat soldiers and just kept sending hospital personnel. Because the Italians, what are they doing? They're trying to heal people while we're trying to kill them. Drove us bonkers. So we, finally the Italians said, we're sick of your abuse, and they withdrew. And then terrorists filled two trucks full of explosives and drove one truck into the Marine Corps barracks and the other truck into the French barracks and blew up a couple hundred Marines and like 150 French. And all of a sudden, Reagan's attempt to make us like war again fails. It falls flat on its face. And then he quickly diverts troops that were on their way to Lebanon to Grenada. And we invade Grenada and conquer a country of 70,000 people and liberate it from the communists. And, and Reagan's like, look, look here. No, don't look there. Look here. Look here. And it, it, it kind of didn't work, but it kind of did work because Americans didn't know what Grenada was. They just knew we had won something. And we were like walking around with our flags going, USA, USA, USA. And then George Bush Sr. does it. We invade Panama in 1989. Uh, what happened was Carter had promised to return the Panama Canal to Panama in 20 years. And so the year before we were going to return Panama Canal to Panama, uh, we invaded Panama and conquered it and overthrew its government to postpone returning the Panama Canal for a few years. It gets returned in the Clinton administration. And then he turns around and does the first Iraq war in 1991, and we win. We, those are the two wars that we've won. Well, that and Grenada, of course. Don't forget Grenada. Since World War II, those are our three victories. There are only three victories, unless you include the Cold War, but it's not really a war. But again, let's go for it. Why not? So we got four, and three of them were under George Bush Sr. <laughs> right? And then he doesn't get a second term which the Republicans interpreted as a terrible betrayal. Like, we finally are winning wars with this guy, and you didn't give him a second term? That was the first illness, disease, that the American public had. The second one was the result of liberalism. The Reagan people believed that liberalism, which they didn't know what the term meant. Liberalism means the belief that capitalism is the best economic system. What they meant was what the Democratic Party had created. That's what they meant, not capitalism. They loved capitalism. They thought it was amazing. The problem was what the Democratic Party had created from 1933 to 1981. They believed that what that did was that created dependency on the government, and it corrupted the American mind and made Americans lazy. So they believe the only way to free them from that and then bring them back to Jesus and maybe bring them back to capitalism also in the process, because the two were interrelated, was to break the federal government. So here he is, Reagan is the president of the United States. He's the guy in charge of the federal government. He comes up with a plan to break the federal government. The plan is to cut taxes for the rich. Now he's happy to do that because the oligarchs are part of the reason he's in power to begin with. And it's also the reason why, one of the reasons why he's busting the unions is he, he is an ally of the rich. The other reason he thinks this is a good idea is because if you cut taxes for the rich, there won't be enough money to fund Social Security and school lunch programs and deal with EPA issues and environmental problems and still have a big military and still have an FBI and still have a CIA that you'll force the American public to make a decision. And the decision will be the question of whether which thing we want to fund and then the rest will have to be cut. And the American public made a radically different decision they decided they wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too. And they wanted to have the tax cuts while at the same time having all the social programs. And so the result of this was that we ended up massive debt spending program. Reagan alone added three and a half trillion dollars to the half trillion dollar debt. It had taken us 200 years to get to a half trillion dollar debt Every year Reagan was in office was like 200 years of spending. At one point, 
he ramped up military spending in the middle of this too, thinking that if we built enough nukes and built enough tanks and built enough airplanes and built enough aircraft carriers, there wouldn't be any money left for the social programs. And he was right, but we went ahead and spent it anyway. Today, our debt is $30 trillion. He triggers a mass spending program that will eventually bankrupt the United States. It is not sustainable. At some point, we're going to have to start paying the debt down. As it is, think of the money we're losing every year to interest. We're hemorrhaging. Even if our interest rate is 2%, do 2% of $30 trillion. This is no small sum of money that we're just hemorrhaging to the banks. It's what it is, is it's rich people welfare at that point. The sum of this story is, because I'm out of time, so I got to wrap it up. This is because I didn't, I messed up. I needed another hour probably. We'll do a part three, because this is actually part two. Isn't that crazy? Because uh, we didn't record part two. I'll, or part one. We'll record part one next semester. But maybe I'll do a part three. Um, but the sum of this is the following. That what Reagan does, what he sets in motion, what he gets going, is exactly the thing that brings us to this point now by bringing us presidents like George Bush Jr. and Donald Trump. And, he, and in part, all of this is this giant reaction to the civil rights movement. That's not the only thing that's driving this, but it is a major part of it. And of course, Trump announces his run for office by saying Mexicans are rapists and murderers. And he openly establishes that he's the racist candidate and if you vote for him, he's going to go after brown people, including Muslims, right? Because he's going to do a Muslim ban, too. And then, of course, one of the amazing features of this was one of the protests here in Austin in 2017. It was called No Ban, No Wall. And Mexican Americans and Muslim Americans, Mexican Texans and Muslim Texans got together in front of the Texas Capitol building. I want to say it was like 2,000 people and did a uh, mass demonstration. By the way, Beto showed up. Uh, one of the Castro brothers showed up. It was a serious event, like people took it very seriously. Anyway, since I'm out of time, I guess that's where we're going to leave it. And uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, you don't have to, it's weird. <laughs>